Please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, move among us that we may hear God's word, and hearing it, we might respond with boldness today and every day. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Several weeks ago, as I was considering the text for this morning's sermon, I concluded that the Spirit was prompting me, leading me to the book of Revelation, specifically 21, 1 through 6. I penciled it in, I shared it with my colleagues, and then I left for a week of vacation. I came back last Monday and I looked at my notes and said, what was I thinking, Revelation? For some, this part of Holy Scripture is a great adventure. For others, not so much. It is considered apocalyptic literature. It tells of the end times using fantastical imagery, mystical visions, symbols, and storytelling. It draws some readers in while others feel, well, they can feel a bit lost or overwhelmed by all the details. Some wonder how this word applies to our lives in the here and now, our day-to-day living. And so that's a great place for us to start. A primary challenge for us is the literal or figurative approach we take when considering this text. Some strains of Christianity have taken the Revelation text as a foretelling of future events, the exact way that our world will come to an end. Movie makers and novel writers have taken full advantage of this, and we consumers have, well, we have eaten that up. Maybe some of you have read book series in years past or watched certain movies. A recent example is the Netflix film Don't Look Up. Maybe some of you are familiar with that one. It's an apocalyptic comedy about a comet headed straight for Earth and the completely oblivious leadership who just don't get it. Well, such imaginative and in this case humorous storytelling isn't inherently bad. It can be engaging and entertaining for sure. The challenge though can come when the imaginative storytelling creates distance in our understanding or distance between us and our creator. Misunderstanding or even fear of the future can be and has been a consequence in how revelation has been interpreted and applied over the generations. So with this in mind, let's turn to the second to last chapter in the Bible. I'm reading today from the Revelation to John chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. Listen and read now that by faith you may receive God's word for you this morning. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I selected this passage because it does, in fact, have a good hopeful and promising word for us as we live our daily lives today. It's in a nutshell, God is with us. We are not alone. That's the first. The second, there is always the promise of new life because of God. 
And thirdly, there is never a time that we are without God's presence in our lives. At our beginning and at our ending, and perhaps as we sit here today most especially, in our present. My most frequent experience with Revelation 21 is on the occasions of memorials and funeral services. The passage is chosen by many for its comforting language. God's going to meet us in our need. God will wipe away every tear. No more mourning. No more dying. No more crying. We yearn for such promises because our lives are full of these things. John provides us with a stunning picture of the living God dwelling among us. But I've sometimes wondered if limiting our use of revelation to dealing with disaster at the end of life or at the time of death might actually limit our vision of God and God being in our midst, dwelling with us in the present. The vision shared in today's reading reveals the true end or goal of life, the destiny of creation that has been taken up into the life of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. And that is the essence of our faith. You may recall that Hebrews 11 speaks of faith, and it says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But at this time, as we are reunited with our Creator, that marks the end of faith because we are seeing. Author Michael Pascarello asks, what, what if we were to look not only at John's vision, as described here in Revelation, but through it? We were to use it as a lens to look through our current life situation. And as we were to contemplate the end, the glorious destiny for which the mystery of grace presses in on us to live somewhere in the middle, between the beginning and the end, precisely where we are, the in-between time. It's between the beginning and the end that we find the challenges of life, that we find the need to be given hope. As followers of a crucified Lord, we are called to walk by faith and not by sight because we haven't gotten to that place yet, the end of our faith. God has not forgotten us in this in-between time while we are in the throes of suffering various challenges. And that may be hard for us to remember. How often do we think about the fact that here we are going through this catastrophe or this challenge or this circumstance. God can't possibly be here. God can't possibly know that I'm going through this or I wouldn't be struggling in this way. It is hard to remember that God has not forgotten us, and that God is with us, that God is dwelling with us. For God never leaves us nor forsakes us. Thankfully, we're given a vision of the beauty of a world where there is no veil between God and humans, where God actually dwells among us, where God lingers. Eugene Peterson, in his biblical paraphrase, The Message, says, God moves into the neighborhood. I love that image. It's so helpful to, kind of tactile, to think, okay, God moves into the neighborhood. So God is dwelling in the house down the street. Wonderful. But then I think of how few of my neighbors I actually know, and then it causes me to pause. Now, maybe some of you who have resided on the same block for 30 years can name all the neighbors. But I know there are some of you who have resided on your block for 30 years who can't because the neighborhood has changed around you. No matter who we are, that challenge is real. God is there among us. But are we relating with God? Are we recognizing God in our midst? 
Are we engaging with God? We are not alone, friends. Today's passage could not feel more timely, it seems. Speaking of a new heaven and a new earth, and that the old has passed away, but particularly the sea was no more. Scholars have long recognized that this isn't just your run-of-the-mill sea. This isn't the nice ocean that you go and enjoy on a holiday. The reference is, in fact, to a sea of chaos, a sea we read about in the first book of the Bible at the start of the biblical narrative. This sea is out of which evil continually threatens to undo the goodness of God's creation. In John's vision here, in Revelation, that threat is removed. Meanwhile, in the in-between time, in our time as we are living, the sea of turbulence and evil is churning off the coast of Ukraine where innocent people are slaughtered and war rages, and in other parts of the world where war rages and lives are lost and governments are faltering and people's needs are not being met, we just don't hear as much about them. And the chaos of the pandemic and all it has revealed about our world, the inequities, the division, the infighting among leadership, has wounded us in more ways than we are yet to even realize. Revelation points us to where the sea was no more. Yes, the sea of pandemic, of illness and death, continues to churn across the globe. Like like you, I imagine, my spirit has been heavy this week with the The reminder that in our country alone, one million lives have been lost. One million deaths have occurred in the United States alone as a result of COVID. Mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, uncles and aunts, brothers and sisters, colleagues and competitors, friends and foes. There's a lot of grief out there, friends. Many grieve while the world marches on. And sure, it's it's hard not to want to just get on with it, to move past what we've been through, but the reality is that many cannot do that so easily. They're still shedding tears and mourning losses that they weren't even able to properly mourn. Revelation tells us that God is near to those who grieve even when the world is marching on. Revelation points us to a time when the sea was no more. The sea of violence churns around us. News outlets report daily mass shootings, evil breaking free from its boundaries, crashing through our streets and schools, places of work and grocery stores. Lord, have mercy. The sea of worry, baby formula shortages, energy outages. My goodness, it's a lot to ponder. And yet the good news of Revelation, the hope of John's vision is that God is present. God is making all things new. When? When is God making all things new? When is my loved one going to be healed? When are these problems going to be resolved? Those are fair questions. But what we do know is that we're not alone and that God is aware and present and dwelling with us. A God who dwells among mortals frames this story. The Alpha and the the Omega, the beginning and the end. Our future with God is a beautiful scene of peace, a redemptive day of hope and promise fulfilled where the sea of evil is no longer lapping at our shores. Friends, relationships grow cold. 
They sour and end. Hurt and disappointment come from those we love. Life seems to be unjust or senseless. Decisions or answers are not readily evident as we would hope. Failure and discouragement accompany our most noble intentions. As John reminds us, we know all too well the reality of tears and pain, of sadness and darkness, of suffering and death. This chapter of John's revelation is a message of hope for us in the in-between time. While it speaks of the beginning and the end, it also tells us something about our present. We are not alone as we live our lives, as we suffer losses, as we face crises, as we navigate unmet expectations or dreams that have not come to pass. We are not alone as we celebrate births and anniversaries and graduations and scholarship recipients. We are not alone as we celebrate a marriage, a new job, a new relationship, new outlooks on life. We are not alone as we await test results or on news of a new job. We are not alone as we await eagerly a text message from that special someone we have yet to hear from. And we are not alone as we prepare to have that hard conversation with our aging parents or as we prepare to speak with our spouse about retirement or falling out of love. We are not alone. Revelation reminds us that our misdeeds or promises that we have failed to keep Don't separate us from God. They are not our end. God is our end. Grace and mercy are our end. Ultimate healing is our end. Write this. For these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. And I would add, and in the end between. May it be so. All thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me? Oh God, you have called us to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown, Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.